Second World War, started by Hitler's aggression against Poland, has spread throughout Europe. Norway, Denmark, Netherlands, and even the mighty France have fallen, reinforcing the image of an invincible German army. When all of Europe stood in shock and disbelief in the face of a crushing defeat, Poland kept fighting. Guerrilla units rallied in the countryside, and the Polish secret state was formed. Polish soldiers in the British Isles were getting ready to ward off the anticipated German invasion. In these difficult times, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill established a new organization, SOE, the Special Operations Executive. He tasked the newly formed command with one goal, set Europe ablaze. Special Operations Executive was ordered to perform a difficult task. It was supposed to manage and coordinate armed resistance throughout occupied Europe, including Poland. SOE was divided into national sections, each one training their own agents and moving them into the Nazi-occupied areas, where they joined and often took command of the local resistance movements. SOE supplied its agents and the local resistance with weapons, explosives, communications and other necessary equipment. Polish national section was granted the highest degree of independence. Relations with SOE were handled by Unit 6 of the Staff Office of First Marshal of Poland. Unit 6 of the Polish Staff Office in England was tasked with maintaining constant communication with the Union of Armed Struggle Headquarters through radio and covert emissaries. Along with the SOE, Unit 6 managed the recruitment and training of agents, who were subsequently moved to Poland along with the necessary funds and equipment. Polish Home Army provided Unit 6 with reports on the current situation in Poland. Unit 6 relayed the intelligence to the Staff Office of the First Marshal. On November 28, 1939, General Sikorski sends a top-secret message to the Polish Army Command in the West. He orders the command to initiate selection process for a secret special ops unit. Candidates for super agents were expected to distinguish themselves with strong character, extraordinary courage and indomitable resolve. They needed to maintain cover under any circumstances and act as political and military emissaries within the occupied country. In May of 1941, the Staff Office of the First Marshal sends another order regarding the recruitment of the Silent Unseen. It is requested to immediately begin the recruitment for the Special Operations Unit. Requirements hereunder are to be followed according to the orders of the FM Staff Office. 1. Voluntary service. 2. Impeccable ideological and moral qualifications. 3. Strength of character and decision-making. 4. Organisational skills. 5. Civilian and military experience. 6. Military rank, from private up to colonel rank. 7. No age requirements, but fully able-bodied. 8. Knowledge of German or Russian is advised. These orders have reached the Polish army units scattered all over the world. At the same time, recruitment officers of Unit 6 have begun the search for suitable candidates in Great Britain and in the Middle East. They were called the Headhunters. Their actions were not well received by the frontline commands, who did not want to give up their best soldiers. However, the First Marshal's orders were carried out without objection. In my case, they didn't ask. It was a proposition. I was summoned. I had good, good commanding officers. By their judgment, I was qualified. And they asked no questions. Mam tutaj kwalifikacje i oni nic nie pytali. 
I think that they just looked through personal files and took whoever they considered qualified. The soldiers who managed to survive the invasion of Poland and broke through to the west, ultimately reaching Scotland, developed various attitudes towards the life abroad. Some enjoyed the stable and somewhat comfortable life among Scottish families. Separated from the war, death and explosions, by the waters of the Canal La Manche, life felt good. They slowly started to assimilate, made friends and many found love. Some of the soldiers could not stand the inaction, apathy, boredom, constant coast patrols and anti-invasion training repeated over and over. The invasion was not coming. Being so far from the main theatre of war was affecting them. They knew that their homeland was fighting back against the invader and bleeding out. They wanted to act, to face their enemy. I remember that some colonel from London visited our company, our anti-tank division. And I was summoned into the company headquarters. And he gave me this option. Told me not to be guided by some false ambitions or anything like it. But said that there is a possibility of going back to Poland and asked me if I was interested. For some of the soldiers, being summoned by the command came as a surprise. Many of them were battling their thoughts. What did I do wrong? Speculations could be heard throughout the corridors, barracks and tents. There was no end to questions, especially considering that those who came back from being interviewed by the command remained dead silent. When the time came for each candidate, they stood before the old man with their hearts in their mouths. It was possible to resign at any time during the recruitment and training process. Such a decision carried no negative consequences. Only the best was suited for a power drop over occupied Poland. Those who decided not to jump served their country on different fronts, also fighting the enemy. And that was what really mattered. They simply observed and decided that I have these qualifications. Physically, I was in my peak. Besides, I knew German and some French. How could one join the ranks of the silent and seen? The officers of Unit 6 were looking for candidates within the army. They started by looking through the personnel files. When they decided on a candidate, they summoned him for an interview. After some time, the silent and seen started to recommend their friends and colleagues. There were cases of Unit 6 officers themselves stumbling upon their acquaintances and then convincing them to join the service. And so rumours spread about those who disappeared from their units, silent and unseen, the parachutes. Before the candidate was officially recruited, he needed to pass an interview, either with Unit 6 officers or with the Colonel Major directly. At the beginning of the interview, Candidates were notified that the subject of their conversation had to remain confidential. The candidate had to sign a statement. I volunteer to be delegated for service in the country. With this declaration, I vow to maintain secrecy. Right after, the recruiter asked, do you want to go back to the country? To the country? To Poland? How? When? 
Surely such thoughts raced across the soldiers' minds. Conversations like these, which determined whether the candidate was prepared to do anything that was necessary, were the beginning of a path for each and every of the silent unseen. It was a long path, paved with numerous training courses, fighting against own weaknesses, limitations and fears. Not many have reached the end, but those who did became highly skilled saboteurs, spies or communication officers. As the final step, they were parachuted into occupied Poland. At the time, I would have gone or flown anywhere. The garrison life in Scotland could go to hell. We were young, we wanted to do something. I would have consented to anything. Anyway, I agreed. The officer thanked me and that was it. Not long after that, I got the order. Following the interview, months have often passed before the candidate was sent out to receive their training. The transfer was often carried out during the night, quietly and in darkness. The same way in which the candidates return to the country after graduating all of their courses, as a silent, unseen 